Orbital Gardens, this is Mission Control. We are confirming acquisition of your signal. You are live in 5, 4, 3, 2... Hello and welcome to episode 40 of Gardeners of the Galaxy, the podcast for all of the sentient beings in the universe who have a passion for plants. I'm Emma the Space Gardener and I will be your host as we explore gardening on Earth and beyond. As part of Tim Peake's Principia mission to the International Space Station, he took part in a big space gardening experiment called Rocket Science. It involved Rocket, a rugula, seed spending six months on the ISS and then returning to Earth to be grown by school children. The idea was to see whether the seeds had been affected by their stay in space and get kids interested in space and STEM in general. Rocket Science was announced with great fanfare at the RHS Chelsea Flower Show and gathered a lot of media attention. Although the initial launch of the seeds into space didn't go according to plan, as we learned in episode 38, rocket science went on to be a great success. Tim Peake named his space mission Principia in reference to the book Naturalis Principia Mathematica, in which Sir Isaac Newton laid out his groundbreaking laws of motion and gravity. Legend has it that Sir Isaac was inspired to think about gravity when he saw an apple fall from a tree in his garden. That tree still exists at Woolsthorpe Manor in Lincolnshire. The world's most famous apple tree is now around 400 years old and its offspring, either grafted clones or grown from pips, have spread far and wide. You may have heard the news recently that a clone at the Cambridge University Botanic Garden was felled by Storm Eunice. They have plans to replace it with another clone. Anyway, while everyone's attention was focused on the rocket seeds, Tim Peake took another, very special set of seeds into space. Seeds from Newton's original apple tree flew to space with Tim, then grew into young trees that have been distributed to eight special locations. They are Walsthorpe Manor, the Eden Project in Cornwall, Brogdale, the home of the UK National Fruit Collection, the Catalyst Science Discovery Centre in Cheshire, the Royal Parks and National Physical Laboratory, the Environmental Education Project at Rosliston Forestry Centre in Derbyshire, Jodrell Bank Discovery Centre in Cheshire, and the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs in Vienna. So how did the project come about, and what's happened to the space saplings? Before we get to that, I'd like to say thank you to my Patreon supporters for their continued support for the show. From just a pound a month, you can join our community of space gardeners and help me keep the astrobotany anecdotes flowing. Visit patreon.com forward slash gardeners of the galaxy for more details. And now, I'm joined by Jeremy Curtis from the UK Space Agency to talk about the Pips in Space project. Hello Jeremy, welcome to Gardeners of the Galaxy, thank you for coming on the show. Hi, thanks, it's a delight to be here. (laughs) So, historically, it's a little bit unusual for people in the UK to be going into the space industry. So can you tell us a little bit about how that happened for you, how you came to be working for the UK Space Agency? Oh, that goes back away. I used to work for the Science and Technology Facilities Council and got into their space department, building X-ray instruments uh, to fly into space. And uh, that was really exciting, but gradually got more and more interested in other aspects like policy and education and skills and eventually I moved over bit by bit into the uh, what was then the British National Space Centre which then evolved into the UK Space Agency that we know today where I'm head of education and skills now. Fabulous and I believe and I, yeah, I'm, I'm talking to you in your conservatory and I believe that you are a gardener so what kind of plants do you enjoy growing here on earth? Oh, goodness. I love growing absolutely everything. Things that are a bit more challenging, I suppose, particularly exciting. So we had uh, this garden room we built. We call it that because it's not really a conservatory. No. Our tech came up with something that had a solid roof so the plants don't get cooked in the summer. So we could grow all sorts of things. And that's been a real discovery for me that the plants that grow in the understory of jungles are what we grow in house, as house plants at home. And they don't like to sit in sunshine mostly. So. Yeah. Works really well. I was going to say, especially in the UK when we don't get any sunshine. Well, actually, this is the first day it's been warm enough to sit in here for months. <laughs> it's been cold, hasn't it? OK, so, I mean, those two strands of your life came together um, because you were part of the team at the UK Space Agency working on activities for Tim Peake's Principia space mission. And one of those things that you arranged was to send pips, apple pips, from Newton's apple tree into space with Tim. So can you explain a little bit about how that idea came to be? 
Well, when we ran a competition right at the beginning of this whole exercise to come up with a name for Tim's mission. So each astronaut names their mission something meaningful. And we had lots and lots of entries. But the one that came top of the list was Principia. We had a big ceremony at the Royal Society where the prize winners all arrived. And there were a whole bunch of people who come up with the name. And the reason Principia is such an exciting name for, for Tim is that it's the name of the book written by Sir Isaac Newton, which uh, he used to write down his understanding of the laws of gravity and quite a lot of other bits of physics and even some maths in there. But that was the name of the book. It's got a longer name, which I can never remember. <laughs> how people talk about it. And of course, everything that Tim needed to get him into space depended entirely on the laws of gravity. And we still use Newton's laws now to program our computers and devise the, the orbits that satellites and rockets need to get into space. So it brought those two things together. And as you say, as a gardener sitting there thinking, hmm, isn't there a way we can widen this a bit? It just struck me this was a perfect example. So we're always trying to reach new audiences to tell them about space. Um, you know, we're a bit um, a bit like that, you know, slightly missionary zeal, I suppose, to try and <laughs> wonderful faces. And I like talking to gardeners, and it struck me that the apple tree that everyone knows, if, even if they can't remember the laws of gravity, they can remember where Newton was when he came up with the idea. So it just seemed the ideal thing. And one day I discovered that the tree that he sat under still grows in Woolsthorpe Manor in Lincolnshire. And so we decided, well, maybe it's worth a go. So I contacted the National Trust at Woolsthorpe Manor and said, is there any chance of some seeds? We might be able to get them into space if you could. And they were up for it. Yeah. Collected a whole bunch of seeds. It's actually more difficult than you'd think. So they managed to get me a whole 26 seeds, I think it was. Not all of them looked prime quality seeds, so we didn't expect a really good result, but uh, we gave those to Tim to fly into space, and that was the nucleus of the idea. Oh, that's brilliant. I mean, it's fantastic that we still have that piece of history growing up in Lincolnshire, and, and it's just survived this long. It's amazing. Okay, so I mean, the, the, the seeds didn't come straight out of an apple and go, go into space, did they? They had to pop off to Kew Gardens for some preparation work first. Indeed, yeah. So if you imagine if you were just growing seeds normally, you wouldn't harvest the pips from an apple tree in the autumn and then sow them instantly because it'd be middle of the winter, the plants or the seeds wouldn't be very happy there. And um, they're used to a period of dormancy anyway. So what Q had to do was to introduce that period of dormancy so that they would be able to, to grow later. But the other thing is that because we wanted them to fly into space so that they effectively linked um, Newton's concepts up with a physical um, experience, if you like, it then meant that we had to dry them so that they could cope with their, their surroundings. And one of the things that we've learned over many years is that plants can cope much better with radiation and other forms of damage if they're dry and dormant than if they're fresh or growing. So the trick is get them well prepared, dried, and sealed in a in a package that they can be taken into space, and they're much more likely to be able to grow when they come back. Yes, I'm in, I'm thinking with something quite as precious as these seeds from Newton's apple tree, it's quite a good job that they weren't in the same packet as the rocket seeds that went the first set of rocket seeds that got blasted into space because they had an unfortunate accident, didn't they? <laughs> yeah. So also, as a totally separate thing with the Royal Horticultural Society flew two, two kilograms of um, rocket seeds into space. Um, I, we just couldn't resist the pun. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the first lot were launched on, I think it was a SpaceX um, from the US. And unfortunately, it blew up very shortly after launch and presumably scattered rocket seeds <laughs> over all of the coastline of, the North America, of North America. And I would love to know. Nobody's ever reported this. But wouldn't it be exciting to discover that our British rocket seeds were growing... Um, as a strange alien on the beaches of North America. <laughs> <laughs> that would be funny. Yes, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't seen anybody say that that's happened. OK, so, so fortunately, the Apple Pips had a more successful trip into space. Uh, and how long were they up there for? Uh, they were there for uh, 198 days, so a bit more than six months. And then they came back down and they went back to Kew again, didn't they? Indeed, yes. Yeah. So when they went back to Kew, now imagine it's like you as a gardener at home getting your packets of seeds arriving from the seeds merchant and uh, you've got to sow them the right way. So they had to be 
warmed gently to 15 degrees and kept there. But I think before that, they kept them at five degrees for a period as the this sort of normal winter dormancy that you'd expect the seeds to encounter if they were growing in the wild or if you were sowing them at home. So there was definitely a s several stages they went through. And of course, having said that, they didn't look like there were the biggest, healthiest seeds you'd ever hoped for. We didn't get 26 seedlings. Uh, I think we got 10 or maybe it was a few more, but only 10 of them started to grow to anything like the degree one would hope. So we ended up with 10 healthy seedlings at first. Okay, so and then and then I think it was eight of them have gone on to find new homes, mostly in this country, sort of strategic points across the country, and, and one in Vienna, and so they're going to be planted for the next generations to be able to, you know, be excited about space. Is was that the point of the project? Uh, yes, indeed. I think everybody relates to science in different ways, and as an engineer myself, I I find that the the uh, the things that we build and send into space are the exciting things and how we use um, the science that we research while we're in space is fascinating. But other people um, relate to science more viscerally, perhaps, um, or through more artistic or narrative approaches. So this is very much an attempt to reach people through different means. And if you imagine you've got, um, let's say, a collection of trees in an arboretum and you bring a party of school kids around who like looking at the trees and you can explain this one has this relationship to a famous physicist and an astronaut um, and the space station it brings a totally different dimension and i think it's quite startling if you're expecting people to tell you one thing you know about fruits or whatever it might be or about how you grow trees to suddenly find that you're being taken down a very surprising avenue so that was very much the approach that we wanted to reach audiences we wouldn't normally expect to encounter because they tend to think well science is for me but this is our way of saying no it's for everybody that would be a surprise wouldn't it if you'd gone to see the plants you wouldn't expect to go to an arboretum and see a tree that's been to space even though these aren't the only ones that have been to space i mean in our pre show chat we were talking a little bit about the moon trees of course which is nasa's famous version of seeds that went all the way around the moon it's yes so um i think it was stuart russa um an uh, astronaut who flew i think it was on the apollo missions or was it the apollo 14 wasn't it well, apollo 14 that was it um so he took some tree seeds from north america and then when he brought them back they were distributed around the world the difficulty is tracing them yeah there's quite a few but it's really hard to find out where they all went um, so every now and then somebody puts their hand up and says, I've got one of them. But they're mostly North American tree seedlings um, with no specific relationship to space, whereas ours is definitely a very um, important origin with a very strong story all of its own. <laughs> so I mean, with the rocket seeds, the, when they came back down to Earth, there were school children all over the country who grew the, ro the rocket seeds that had been into space and the control seeds that hadn't to see whether there were any differences. And the answer was, after everybody had done their science, that there was but only very slightly. With the, the apple saplings, are we expecting to see any differences from, because of their trip in space? Not visibly. Um, now, having done the experiment with the rocket seeds, and you know, we had uh, eight and a half thousand schools take part, so we had a lot of samples. Any individual class was in, invited to guess or to uh, decide for themselves which of the two packets they've got have been in space and which haven't. So they've got a blue and a red and they didn't know which was which. We told them afterwards, but they had to guess first. And almost exactly half guessed one and almost exactly half guessed the other. And guess what? They were almost exactly as likely to be right as wrong. However, very slightly more guessed right and actually very slightly more of the seeds that have been into space were slightly less healthy, didn't grow quite as fast or quite as many leaves um, or died earlier. So clearly the space trip had done them some harm, but it was a minute difference. And this is one of the reasons that we did the, the whole experiment was to show young people how science works. It's all very well you grow a bunch of seedlings. You can do this at home. Sow some mustard and cress in two different types of potting compost, for example, and see the difference. Yeah. Well, That'll be probably enough for you, but it's not really very scientific because it might be somebody else does the experiment somewhere else with slightly different conditions and they get the opposite result. Well, then what you do, you still don't know. All you have to do is do it many, many times. And if you're looking for a tiny difference, 
you have to do an awful lot of experiments before the statistics show that you've got a result. So statistically, we can demonstrate that there was a tiny, tiny difference, but it is so small that with only a couple of dozen seeds, you would not be able to measure anything different between the ones that have been in space and if there had been a similar set that we grew in exactly the same way on the ground. Having said that, we had 10 seedlings grow. In the end, two of them were the runts of the litter and didn't really flourish. So we gave eight healthy saplings to the, the places you were talking about earlier, and uh, we had two left over. And I said to Q, we probably need to put these out of their misery, but they weren't so hard-hearted as me. <laughs> so we tried grafting them and uh, see if they could actually get them to survive that way. But having spoken to uh, the colleagues at Q who were responsible, they said they didn't survive that treatment either. So we do only have eight now, um, but at least they are all apparently healthy for now. <laughs> so are there any plans to revisit them in a few years and do any testing to see whether they are unvisibly different? Uh, well, what would you look for? What we're expecting to see, if there is any damage from space, um, and we asked the kids doing the rocket seed experiments to see if they could guess what changes uh, or what hypotheses they could come up with about changes that they could detect. And actually, the main one you would expect is radiation. So there's a lot of cosmic radiation in space. We're protected from it on the ground, or at least we're protected from most of it, not quite all. So, you know, we still get damage to ourselves from radiation from space. So that's why you wear sun cream, for example, to keep the extreme ultraviolet damage to your skin off. Um, but most solar radiation and cosmic radiation is uh, prevented from reaching us through our atmosphere. But on the space station, of course, they get a rather more. So what it does is it damages the DNA, it damages the cell structure and the structure inside the cells of these plants. And if the DNA changes, then it can cause damage. And, you know, we all know what that does to us. It can cause cancers and so on. So that's the kind of thing you'd expect to see. But it's a matter of degree. You wouldn't see anything different. You just see a little bit more of it. So if, for example, one of these plants developed some slight change, we would not know whether it was due to natural background radiation that we get all the time on the Earth or something they encountered while they were in space. So to be quite honest, I don't think we're going to get very much um, understanding from doing that. It'll just be a curiosity if they do behave strangely. Yes. And of course, these aren't clones of the original tree. They are offspring. So genetically, they will all be different anyway. Yes. Um, so we don't even know what sort of apple trees they're going to grow into and whether they're going to have nice fruit or anything like that, do we? Exactly. So if you think about it, most apple trees are grafted so that they are on a more suitable rootstock for the place you want to grow and for the style of tree you want to grow. These are not. They're on their own roots. And you will generally choose two parents that you think might uh, produce an interesting offspring. And usually you'll go through many, many, I don't know, hundreds or whatever of seedlings before you find one that you think is actually an improvement on its parents. Um, but that's nature. In this case, we're growing all of the ones that we can possibly get to grow. So it is going to be slightly random. And bear in mind that the, uh, the parent, um, at least the, the parent holding the seeds in this case, was a variety called the Flower of Kent, which, frankly, when you taste the apples, they're not remarkable. Um, I don't know whether they were intended for cider making or for cooking or something, but it's not the best eating apple I've ever come across. <laughs> so, you know, starting off with a tree like that and then... Uh, crossing it with some other random parent. Who knows, we may end up with something amazing. So let's hope one of these eight turns into a real first-class apple that we can all hanker after growing in our own gardens. That'd be phenomenal. But we might all find that they're just disgusting <laughs> and only good for, 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 for shooting practice. Space cider. <laughs> OK, so on a more personal note, have you ever wanted to go into space? Did you want to be an astronaut? Uh, well, funnily enough, the opportunity did arise once, and I thought this was ridiculous. How could I possibly apply? But um, if you remember when the Juno mission was announced and Helen Sharman flew into space, um, I applied against that. And to my amazement, I think there were about 13,000 people applied, and I got through the first round. I thought, that's a bit strange. But I got through the second round, and I ended up in the last 15 in the end, um, to my amazement. And as I've got further through the process, it got harder and harder to, to say, well, actually, I'm not sure I want to do this, because there were so many people who were betting on me going. 
but I couldn't really back out. In the end, the best woman won. Helen was definitely the right person to choose um, and did a first-class job. She came off some of the tests smiling where the rest of us were green. And um, frankly, you know, good luck to her, I thought. <laughs> Fantastic. I've re- I've read Helen's memoir and it does sound like some of, certainly some of the medical tests were really quite strenuous. I had things poked into just about every orifice that God provided and a few extra ones for good measure. <laughs> <laughs> that would certainly put me off trying, <laughs> applying to be an astronaut. OK, so assuming you were ever to go into space and you were able to join a community, whether that's on a space station or a Mars on the moon, and you can take a plant with you, you've got one personal plant in your baggage allowance, what would you choose and why? Oh, goodness, this is an impossible question. You know, it's like asking a parent to choose which is their favourite child, isn't it? It is. There's, we actually did an experiment a little bit along these lines. Um, when we launched the uh, the rocket science competition at the Chelsea Flower Show. So we had a huge stand, which we shared with the RHS. But I mean, you can imagine what that's like, standing on your own stand, which is also the RHS stand at the biggest flower show in the world. It was amazing. But on the, the, in the middle of the stand, we had 10 plants growing, um, which astronauts had nominated as their choice of plant to fly. So we had things like soybeans, because they're very high in nutrition and efficient way of producing protein in, in small quantities. There were potatoes, there was rice, there were tomatoes, there were, I'm trying to think what the other ones were now, there was um, some sort of greens, I think there was beetroot, some slightly odd choices, I think. But it went with what different cultures thought were important staple foods. And, you know, astronauts come from just about every nation on Earth, so you'd expect a big variety. And I'm trying to think what one. I think it might have been either the tomato or the potato. And I have to say that I love food. I love growing vegetables. And that's one of the things I would miss most is something zingy and full of vitamin C. So I think I'd probably choose something that I could eat. And I suspect that tomatoes might come near the top of that list because when you've been away from home for a long time, and you've only been eating stuff out of tins and plastic bags and reconstituted dry mush. The idea of a fruit that you can grow yourself is quite appealing. And it's probably more manageable than growing citrus fruits in space or something a bit more obscure like that. A bit quicker as well. <laughs> a little bit quicker, yeah. I mean, we haven't seen them grown on the space station yet for consumption. But that is in the pipeline. NASA does have plans to do um, tomatoes. Of course, they've just done the space chilies, which was the big success of last year. Um, so I fingers crossed, I think we might see the tomatoes this year. So that will be something to to look out for. The reason that we chose the um, rocket science competition in the first place was because we'd seen another a couple of countries do similar sorts of experiments using tomato seeds. So there was a Canadian one called Tomato Sphere, and uh, I was trying to find out how they'd run this. And Chris Hadfield came to London, and after his talk, I managed to buttonhole him and say, so what was the scientific hypothesis that was being tested by flying these seeds? And he said, you don't understand. The point is, the kids grow the seeds, it's exciting, they've been to space, that's all there is to it. And I said, yes, but you're getting them to do a scientific experiment. What's the experiment? And he said, you don't understand. And then we went round and round in circles. And in the end, I thought, rather than getting cross or him getting cross, I'd better just back off. So I left him to it and backed away and nearly fell over somebody in a wheelchair and looked around and it turned out to be Stephen Hawking, um, <laughs> who's also been at the lecture. So that was quite an, an evening. I didn't learn very much about that. But we decided the experiment that we were doing was to see whether Rocket was actually going to grow enough, grow in space well enough for us to treat it as a crop. That was the first step. The next step would then be, OK, we can get it to grow in space, but can you leave the seeds in space long enough to be able to harvest them and make it into a, a long term crop? So we haven't yet tested that. But in due course, maybe we'll be able to get kids doing that with the next experiment. Oh, that would be awesome. I mean, we did. You did kind of prove that, you know, rocket will grow in space and it will be healthy enough. And, it, you know, there were no showstoppers there. So we can have rocket salad in space. So, yeah, that's a first step. You've glossed over, you were talking about some of the celebrity um, space people that you, um, you've you encountered in your career, but you kind of glossed over the, the Chelsea Flower Show. You met the Queen, didn't you? 
Yes, that was extraordinary. I mean, the way these things work out sometimes, I was in charge of the, the project we were doing, so I was sort of the main interface there. But, of course, when it comes to the big event, you really like your chief executive to do the meeting and greeting. So he was there, and we were told that the rules are very strict for the VIP day. There's only one person allowed on each stand, um, and uh, you know, the Queen will go where the Queen goes, and you won't have any say in the matter. You probably won't meet Prince Philip because he'll probably peel off before you get to the, the Grand Pavilion because he likes to go and look at the, the lawnmowers or whatever. Um, and um, who knows whether you'll meet anybody else. So there I was at lunchtime, and my chief executive said, right, I need to go now. I've got to catch a train. So he was going off to a meeting in Brussels, and I thought, oh, right, so that means I'm in charge then. Right, fine. Then it turned out we were allowed to have a couple of extra people. So um, I had two colleagues with me as well. And then I was standing there waiting and realised that Princess Anne was walking past. I thought she was going to miss our stand. It was a big stand with four entrants at the different sides. And she was going off in another direction. It turned out she was just about to arrive from a different side. And when you've carefully worked out your narrative and how you're going to take your visitors around from A to B to C to D, and then they come in at... B or D, you've got to re rephrase them. <laughs> came on one side. A little bit later, um, Prince Philip turned up from a different direction uh, who wanted to know all about it. Then a bit later, Prince Charles came past and Miller was with him and he didn't have time to stop, but he was being guided around by the head of science for the RHS and he said, this is our science stand. He will come to see. So I could see there was a little bit of discussion. Could he spare the time? And Camilla obviously said yes. So he came over for an explanation. So it was sort of getting a bit old hat by the time the Queen arrived almost. But that was really exciting to, to meet the Queen, to show her, you know, how kids can be so excited by science and being involved in doing stuff hands on. So, yeah, it was quite a day <laughs> <laughs> I bet. so I mean that's absolutely fabulous I mean the, um, Tim Peake was our first official British astronaut and to have him do two gardening experiments two space plant experiments in during the one mission was absolutely amazing so well done yeah well, about calling him um, our first official astronaut he was certainly the first government backed one but Helen Sharman was absolutely our first British astronaut absolutely yes <laughs> OK, well, uh, thank you so much for coming on the show and telling us those stories. That's absolutely fabulous. It's been a pleasure and um, I'd love to come back another time and tell you more about rocket science. Oh, that would be great. I'd love that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So what has happened to the space saplings since they were adopted by their forever homes? In January 2020, Tim Peake planted the first at its ancestral home in Woolsthorpe Manor. He also hosted the ceremony in which the other seven saplings were formally adopted. And in September 2021, Tim tweeted that the last space sapling had been planted at the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs in Vienna. Corin Kitzel, the ambassador at UK Mission in Vienna, planted the tree with UNOSA director Simonetta Di Pippo. It can now be seen by visitors to the Vienna International Centre. But I didn't know what had happened to the other six. Had they been planted? Are they accessible to visitors? So I fired off emails to the relevant sites and I have had some replies. I'll do the best one first. Last month, Ryan and I were planning a trip to the Eden Project, which is something we like to do every couple of years. When I emailed the PR team there to inquire about their space sapling, I got a very helpful response. They told me that the pandemic had caused a delay in planting and put me in touch with Living Landscapes garden manager, Julie Kendall. Ryan and I were able to meet Julie during our visit and she talked about her plans to put the tree into a special science garden later this year. It will be outside the core education building, off to one side of the famous biomes. The best bit was that Julie brought the sapling along to show me, so I have met one of the space saplings. I'm looking forward to seeing it in position on our next visit. The Rosliston Astronomy Group have a page on their website for the Rosliston space sapling, which gives the background to its story, shows it being planted, and has updates on its growth until March 2021. I had an email back from Heather Lomas, who has been very involved in the space saplings project there. On the 14th of March 2020, right before the UK went into Covid lockdown, the tree was planted next to the Peter Bolas Observatory, which was being formally opened by the Chief Scientist of the UK Space Agency. 
Heather says that whereas the other recipients have very organised access for the general public with tickets and guides, the Rosliston sapling is different in that it's planted in 154 acres of the forestry centre with open access to all. Unfortunately, that does bring into play the risk of vandalism to the tree. And so it has been planted in a group of other saplings, which will act as decoys and hopefully prove to be a cutting defence for years to come. Heather also revealed that she initially called the space sapling Twiggy, as it is extremely late coming into leaf compared to all the others around it. She measures it regularly during the year and photographs various stages of its growth. Twiggy has a special place in outreach work with beavers, cub scouts, scouts and local community groups like the Women's Institute. And the concept of linking space to earth in such a way is a very popular one and engages no end of interest. So that's another space sapling safely planted in a good home and continuing its mission to inspire the next generation of space gardeners. The response from Judgeral Bank is that their sapling wasn't planted before Covid struck. As the centre was closed for many months, the sapling was taken home to be cared for by a staff member. So hopefully we will see that one being planted soon. The new First Light Pavilion Visitor Centre is due to open there on the 4th of June this year. So maybe the space sapling will be planted during those celebrations. But there are three space saplings which I haven't received any new information. Whether or not Brogdale, the Royal Parks and National Physical Laboratory and the Catalyst Science Discovery Centre have planted their trees or are planning to do so soon remains a mystery. Hopefully it won't be too long before I can update you on their status. That's it for this episode. I am eternally grateful to my patrons who support the show financially and if you'd like to join that elite group then you just need to go to patreon.com forward slash gardeners of the galaxy. I have also recently started a new LinkedIn group called Space Plants and Astrobotany, and if you want somewhere to chat about your passion for space plants, then do come and join us there. I'll be back soon with a new crop of Astrobotany. In the meantime, thanks for listening. Goodbye. Orbital Gardens, this is Mission Control. Confirming termination of your signal. The higher-ups are recommending you try a fruit experiment next. They know you're nervous, but they think you should grow a pair.